When I was about 10 years old, I became totally enamored with the book by Jan, the Stanley's old horror. Sure. And I guess primarily because uh, a true story was printed on the front cover. Mm-hmm. Um, if you remember, it was that black cover with the devil's tail and not yep. the flies and all of this. And so uh, I was just very obviously uh, taken by the entire story, the allegations of a haunting. Um, obviously, the mass murder that had been, you know, occurred in the house in 1974. Uh, at the hands of the oldest son. Um, all of these things under one roof uh, very much intrigued me. And in many ways, Amityville kind of represents, you know, the, the America's, if not the world's most uh, famous uh, and infamous haunted house controversy. Mm-hmm. So I, um, you know, over the subsequent years, became uh, very interested in almost uh, an Amityville uh, obsessive, I guess, um, to the point that I was, you know, looking into records of the Historical Society, taking trips to Amityville. I had uh, to take photographs and meet people um, who worked on the case. Um, and uh, I actually subsequently uh, became you know, friends over the phone with uh, people like Laura DiDio, who was an investigative reporter, uh, and actually a news assistant uh, for Channel 5 News mm-hmm. uh, at the time of these occurrences that happened to the Lutz family. And so, uh, yeah, upon this, I was just, I was very driven with the story and very passionate about it. I developed a website, kind of what I would describe as a web archive called AmityvilleFiles.com, which is kind of a treasure trove, a, a creative presentation of uh, a lot of the documentation that surrounds the story, a newspaper archive and things that I've collected through friends and people I've met online um, over the years. And so, yeah, it was just a process of trying to create somewhere people could go and pull their own conclusions about what they believe happened in that house. And there are so many different theories about what happened in that house. Um, it's very easy to say that what the Lutzes claims happened was all a hoax and none of it ever happened. But I really think that the truth of the matter lies somewhere between it being fabricated and it being an, an out and out uh, truth. Before you made the film... Uh, where did you feel that the truth actually lay uh, on this haunting story? I know you said somewhere in the middle, but be a little bit more specific as to where you, you kind of feel things had, had been uh, or where they, they were sitting in reality before you talked with Daniel. Well, for me, obviously, it was just a story before I met with Danny. Um, I had always just you know read. It was all of what I had read and talked to. I'd never actually spoken to any of the family members. So uh, my gut instinct was, even before meeting Danny, um, that there was some truth to it. That, obviously, I don't think a family abandons all of their worldly possessions and runs from this house and flees clear across the country over nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, while I do think that, you know, there were very many things that have been said about this house, I don't believe everything that's been said by the Lutzes, by the media, um, and a lot of the truth has become misconstrued about what actually they said, and that's that's the actual you know shame of this entire case that it's been clouded and lost in so much uh, misinformation over the years. To develop a real well-rounded opinion about it, honestly, you have to dig through all the muck <laughs> that surrounds the story, and and that includes the DeFeo case and um, the subsequent families who lived there who said nothing ever happened to them. Strange and there's nothing to the story, and you know, this is all just a big hoax. Um, I just think that's too convenient of an answer. I, I believe something definitely of a genuine uh, paranormal nature did happen to the Lutz family. However, I do think that it snowballed into something now that it never actually represented, um, and it's, there's been so much said about it. Mm-hmm. It's, it, yeah, it's just, it's now uh, America's most famous haunted house. Sure. <laughs> and then, you know, in many ways, there's been many hauntings that have happened to other people uh, in many ways that are more severe and, and I think a little bit more, I guess, powerful in nature than, than the Amityville case. For some reason, I think the mass murders uh, enhanced that idea. How did you begin communicating with Daniel? So through Amityville Files, I was contacted one day out of the clear blue sky by a friend of his. Uh, in the Queens area, uh, who said he knew Danny and Danny was interested in talking publicly. However, he wanted to speak with somebody who knew the case and didn't want to have to educate somebody on all of the story that surrounds it. Have any of the other children, because obviously there were there was other children in the house when this happened, have mm-hmm. any of them ever come forward with any pieces of information? Yes, uh, Christopher Coratino, who is Dan's brother, uh, actually has spoken publicly 
uh, in various venues, uh, similar things that Danny actually claimed to me, and, and in the film, of course, that his stepfather, George Lutz, was involved in occult dabblings inside the house, and they believe triggered the haunting on the family. Um, now, of course, I don't want to speak for Christopher because that's not my job. It's not my job to speak for anybody but myself, of course, but um, this is widely known and something that I was obviously familiar with once I met Danny. You know, George passed away in 2006. You know, to be making allegations about someone who now is gone uh, was definitely a concern to us filmmakers, just to be you know, very careful to how to tread on that area. Sure. However, Danny's story is wrapped up in the memory of the stepfather and what he feels the stepfather perpetrated uh, on the family. The talks of George being involved in the occult, that was the first time I had heard it was in your film. I was unaware that the other brother had talked about that as well. Other than than, than Danny talking about it in your film and, and the other brother having mentioned this over the years as well, did George ever make any references to him being involved in the occult in his later years? I know he was doing some interviews, but I had never Not heard... Not to my knowledge, yeah. no. And he'd been interviewed at the time. It's actually there's a clip in my film about uh, with George and Kathy are sitting on uh, Good Morning America. Sure. And they're asked, you know, flat out... Did were you interested in the believers in the occult? And they both say no. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's in the film, you know, juxtaposed with Danny talking about uh, George being involved uh, with satanic ritual and having books on. I know there had been a lot of stories uh, towards the end of George's life when he was doing interviews, and I don't know if you've heard this either, uh, where the people who were scheduled to interview George, and he was granting some of those, Prior to him speaking to them, strange things, events would be happening to the folks that were going to be interviewing. Now, they weren't tragic or anything like that, but just kind of unexplained, odd things, accidents around individuals uh, prior to to, to that. Have you ever heard of anything of that nature? I can't say that I have. I wish that I would have been able to speak with George uh, personally. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't have the, you know... A good fortune many people did to speak with him, but uh, I certainly would have uh, pursued to get his point of view in this project. In many ways, I feel I wish something of a first-person documentary uh, nature, like we did with Danny, could have been done with George, mm-hmm. because it, that was honestly what needed to be done. Sure. Uh, it would have been an entirely different film, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, no, I, I haven't heard those, those uh, stories. I think a lot of your, you know, the paranormal, at least from my opinion, hauntings, you know, you can be very susceptible to a haunting. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you believe in hauntings, if you believe in evil, mm-hmm. then obviously it's going to be enhanced more. Uh, George, I know at the time, claimed that he was un- a non-practicing Methodist when they moved into the Amityville house, mm-hmm. and neither George nor Kathy were uh, overly religious. Mm-hmm. At the time, of course, w- moving out of the house, they definitely became much more involved in the church. Um so these allegations of George being involved in the occult and, and you know, satanic rituals and this type of thing uh, seemed very, um, obviously, the anger toward the stepfather from, from Danny, mm-hmm. I felt many of his statements were colored by his anger. Sure. And, you know, obviously, the need to put the blame on someone, I, you know, I was always wondering what, what that is. Of course, that's my opinion. Mm-hmm. I really wanted the film to speak for itself and for Danny to have, uh, you know, film allowed uh, room to breathe a little bit in that way mm-hmm. uh, for people to make up their own mind because my job as a documentarian is to be objective with the, with the content sure and I really think our film because they were dealing with a you know a boy who was 10 years old at the time we're dealing with someone who <sighs> the memory of the event now is mixed with media interpretations of, of the occurrences mm-hmm. by no fault of his own um, in my opinion and I think that uh, it's unfortunate because what the film represents for me is kind of the fuzzy line between reality and imagination. Mm-hmm. And so that's unfortunate. Um, obviously, like I said, I would love to have talked to George Lutz, mm-hmm. um, but the story that I was able to capture and extract from somebody who was there, obviously who had never spoken publicly about this, mm-hmm. and, and none of the kids have to this degree. This is the first time this, is, this has happened in such a, you know, a feature type of presentation. You know, it's a sad and tragic picture. Danny, Danny was a victim, and I wanted to show the utmost respect for him to come forward. And obviously, you know, we had many discussions, you know, uh, it was the process of making the film. I kind of had to, you know, befriend Danny mm-hmm. and tell him, you know, this is, you're sure you want to open this door? Because 
once, you know, if you're not identified as the Amityville kid now, you certainly will be once this is out, you know, now as an adult. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a difficult, it's, it's a very difficult picture. And there's been so much said about this case and, and for someone uh, who was an adolescent at the time to now try to move forward and rationalize something unexplainable to a, uh, you know, a public who's already mired in decades of misinformation, um, you know, it's, it, as I said, it's a very difficult picture. It's not the easiest of prospects. Did anything odd occur throughout the making of this film, uh, whether it be, you know, something slight or something major? Did you have anything strange happen to you or any of your crew? I can't say that I did. Um, I know that when we were shooting uh, at Lorraine Warren's uh, occult museum and we had Danny and, and uh, everyone, that was, I know some of the camera operators and things were a little unnerved because I think the, of the surroundings Mm -hmm. um, and it was a, kind of, a, little, a little bit of an uncomfortable uh, shoot, you know. Mm -hmm. I think I would mainly attribute that to Danny's intensity mm -hmm. um, and how he dealt with that entire uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Because by the, you know, it was it was a difficult process of getting Danny to want to talk about this sure. at all. Honestly, I mean, he wanted to come forward to connect with me, but it wasn't like he was open and, and uh, uh, he was open for Danny, and I appreciate that from him. But uh, we were, I'm, I'm, I still look at the film, and I'm flabbergasted that we were able to get <laughs> as much as we did on camera mm -hmm. and in the can in an editable fashion. Um, but no, I can't say that anything of a paranormal nature uh, occurred to me or my crew while we were shooting it. Thank God. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what were your <laughs> but, first, you know, when you first got to sit down with Danny before the cameras came in, when you actually had the tape recorder and you went in and you met with him, what were your right. first impressions of Danny? Uh, just a overly angry, uh, just person. I mean, he was, my first meeting with him, uh, was at a diner in Queens. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I went there and his very first question he asked me was, you know, what is your religion? I brought a digital recorder with me about a, you know, a collection of photographs from the March 6th, 1976 investigation. And you could feel the years kind of coming off his chest. Mm -hmm. Um, he was sitting across from me kind of you know, chain smoking cigarettes. It was it was a powerful thing. Um, by this point, we were in a you know, in we weren't in the diner. We were somewhere. You know, we were in in, in his place, so it was mm -hmm. fine. But uh, it was a private thing. But it was you could definitely feel. Uh, you know, some of these photographs he had never seen before. Some mm -hmm. photographs of his bedroom, his toys on the shelf, mm -hmm. uh, his, and you know, the furniture they left, the clothes. You know, and it was it was a obviously an emotional thing for him. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt then that, you know, kind of my initial skepticism of this being something he was doing uh, for attention or money or something kind of dwindled away at that point because I realized this was almost like a cathartic sense of uh, settling a score with himself mm -hmm. that he needed to, I guess for lack of a better phrase, you know, exercise the demons of his past. That was the process of, of what that was all about. When you brought the photos to him, obviously one of the most infamous photos of the case is is the ghost boy photo. Right. Did you ever get his opinion on on that photograph in particular? Unfortunately, not on camera. I do have it on audio cassette, and he did talk about how he believes that it's it's uh, credible, that he believes that it was something. Uh -huh. um, my own opinion, actually, we've done quite a bit of uh, friends of mine have come done some research on this over the years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there's quite a bit of debate on that picture. I mean, it does represent uh, a fellow who was actually brought in assistant uh, to the warrant named Paul Bart, who was in the house at the time. And there's a lot of speculation whether that was actually him, because if you look closely, uh, you can see that he, the, whatever figure is peering around the corner uh, is wearing, it looks, appears to be a, a plaid, you know, like a flannel shirt, mm -hmm. uh, and has eye, it appears to be eyeglasses that, you know, when you look at it from just looking at the photograph, not up close, it looks like luminescent eyes. Sure. Um, so what's more likely here? I don't know. But this, this camera was on a timer. It was a camera on the second floor mm -hmm. uh, set up by Gene Campbell, who was hired by the Warrens to be there that night. And, um, yeah, there was just so many different photographs being taken at the time. And so that was just one that was found by George's secretary, I think, uh, around after the book came out initially in the, in the late 70s. Because it certainly is one of the most eerie, uh, whether it's real or not, ghost photographs that have, have ever been published. Laura DiDio actually told me that, you know, I, I won't go as far as, obviously I don't want to speak for her. Sure. She, you know, she's told me that she feels, you know, she does, she knows there were no children in the house. Yeah. Um, 
she doesn't know who that is or what what that is, and I guess I get the sense from her that she believes that it actually was uh, of some sort of you know specter in the house. If you look at photographs of of uh, one of the DeFeo children, it has a striking resemblance to them, really, uh, which is pretty chilling as well. Yeah. Are, have there been, all I know from the, the research that I've done is that that is the only photo that, that seemed to show anything uh, paranormal or, or relatively paranormal. Is there any other photo evidence or anything of that nature that has ever come out that, that showed anything odd? Nothing from the time. I know there's about 3,000 photographs of, of reflections on windows of mm-hmm, <laughs> sure. people driving up and taking pictures that, that, you know, some of those are very, very odd, obviously, but... Uh, I wouldn't say that there's any, there's certainly no proof, you know, concrete proof. There, well, actually, I'm missing over one thing. Um, uh, that actually is briefly mentioned in the film, but never really, uh, it's never really pinpointed. There's the infamous um, moose head photograph that was taken, uh, again, by Gene Campbell at the house during the investigation. And it's a photo of Lorraine Warren, who at the time was holding uh, uh, an icon as Padre Pio, who mm-hmm. was, you know, St. Pio was a saint. Um, at the time, and she had received this icon before going into the house and had this with her during the investigation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I know that uh, George and uh, Lorraine and uh, others believe there's actually a formation of Padre Pio's face, which is quite striking. It looks uh, very much very similar to photographs of, you know, the side of Padre Pio's face in the moose head itself. Really? Um, there's different pictures, yeah, that, that represent that actually look like a face. Um, but I think, again, I, I hate to be a pessimist, but for me, it looks, it looks very much like it could just be a formation in the actual Moose's head. Um, but it's one of those things. There's, there definitely is no concrete proof or evidence, mm-hmm. um, for any of it that's been captured on camera other than those two intriguing photographs. In the film that you made, uh, towards the end, you asked Daniel about taking a lie detector test, um, and he obviously right. seems almost uh, offended uh, by by the question. Uh, I'm sure right. it's something he's been asked many times in the past, too. Why do you think it was that, that he reacted the way he did? Well, I could answer that simply. I think he took it as an assault on his credibility. Mm-hmm. Um, he had sat there for eight hours, and I had allowed him without confrontation, without me pushing any, you know, any buttons. And, and me asking a question about a lie detector test was not me trying to, you know, it was not a, I guess you'd say a gotcha question or, sure. or something like that. It was really a valid question. I actually prefaced the statement with, uh, you know, in 1979, George and Kathy, your parents, took lie detector tests and passed with flying colors. Uh, and this is true. You know, they were asked questions like, did you levitate? Did you see yourself as an old hag in terms of... Mm-hmm. For Kathy, and um, yes, yes, and they again passed with flying colors. Um, so, I think it was a valid question. Your parents did this. Would you be willing to do this? Mm-hmm. Um, and he took it again as an assault on his credibility from the standpoint of he had sat there for eight hours, poured his heart out essentially to me, and mm-hmm. in front of you know three other camera operators who whom he didn't know at all. Mm-hmm. And you know it was an intense. I mean, he's clearly visibly shaken in the film and, and quite disturbed by the entire topic. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it wasn't my uh, intention to get such a, to elicit such a reaction out of him. However, um, I do think I did include it uh, in the film at, at the end because I think that it keeps the question of whether this was a fabrication or whether this was the truth right on the line because at the end of the day, that's all we're left with. The mm-hmm. truth is unattainable in this case. There were only five people in that house who can corroborate their stories. And George and Kathy are now passed over. Of course, we have their story, on, you know, documented in so many different, you know, formats, mm-hmm. venues that have been, you know, over the years. Um, and this is the first time Danny is, is coming forward. Christopher's talked about it. I know, I know his sister uh, wishes to remain pi- private, and, you know, I think everybody respects that mm-hmm. and understands that. She was very, very young at the time. So, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. So, I think the state of, of the case today is in many ways Danny represents the living embodiment of everything that's been wrong with his story in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, because of the memories that he remembered, you know, I talked about, well, the film goes into heavily the idea that his memories are skewed by media versions of the events. Mm-hmm. And that's unfortunate. Um, however, I do believe so many of the things he talks about are genuine and that he does remember these things. But also we're talking about a child's perception on something that's been, you know, over 35 years 
ago now. Sure. And so it's a, it's a very, very difficult picture, and obviously a sad and tragic portrait of someone who's been, you know, psychologically damaged by something that he essentially was indoctrinated into at a very early age. Was and, you know, that that's the real Amityville horror for me. Was there anything that Daniel told you that made your opinion of the truth about the Amityville horror sway one way or the other? I would say that the the, the light that's been shined on the family dynamics of the story um, really, you know, gave me pause for thought. Um, because in so many ways, Danny's story is mixed. The, the, he's almost haunted by his stepfather, George. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of his claims of the supernatural are mixed or interlaced with uh, his statements about the stepfather, which kind of, for me, it's, it's you know, I mean, I, I don't want to say it's the same as true for Christopher, because we haven't heard his entire story, but in a lot of ways, you know, making statements about George perpetrating the haunting or instigating the haunting on the family... Um, I guess says a lot about that perception of mm-hmm. how they view that time in their life. You know, for me, you know, his, their natural father was removed from the picture and replaced by someone who was an ex-marine, and obviously, by all accounts, I was able to talk to a very domineering personality. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, without trying to make allegations for someone I never met, which is you know obviously the problem here, um, everyone was kind of unnerved by him. Mm-hmm. Um, that I was even Lorraine Warren, and who speaks in the film about him, yeah. uh, was kind of put off by him. Mm-hmm. So it's you know it's a difficult uh, topic to step forward into in mm-hmm. that area, especially since. But you know, since it's such a contentious, it's already such a contentious uh, controversy. Since the film has been completed and is now out, have you been in contact at all with Danny, and have you gotten his his feedback on on the film? Yeah, actually, yes. Uh, well, I say yes. Just a couple of days ago, when the film actually finally was released uh, theatrically and and on uh, video on demand, he he called me uh, to congratulate me and thank me for helping him uh, get his story told, and that obviously is probably the highest praise I could, as a filmmaker could ever receive. Sure. Especially when it's such a sensitive topic about someone. You know, the film's about him, and it hasn't been an easy process because Danny put an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of trust in me, mm-hmm. which I greatly respect and obviously appreciate. Um, so, you know, yes, he's seen the film. Um, he's happy to have gotten this off his chest. Um, again, I keep saying it, but I don't, I don't want to speak for him, but uh, hopefully at some point he'll be willing to step out and talk about it publicly again. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know he told me when we started this project, he was not interested in, in having you know thousands of, of press uh, interviews and this type of thing. That he wanted to tell this one time and and, and be done with it. Mm-hmm. And um, that's basically what we're left is right now. And so he and I are on very cordial level. What do you personally want people to take away from this film? I want people to remember that you know it's easy to call the story a hoax and that this was all you know some sham created by the Lutzes for money. However. I don't think someone who goes through this and you look at Danny and you look at his reaction, uh, you don't end up that way over nothing. There was there was definitely something that happened to these people that, that was earth-shattering and completely has shaken up their lives. And the idea that someone's living in the shadow of something for the rest of their lives is something that kind of transcends Amityville. It talks about anybody trying to explain or rationalize the unexplained. Mm-hmm. to the public, and I think that's kind of, a, a, I don't know, a topic that really hasn't really been given serious consideration before, so I really wanted to do something new with a case that really has been mistreated in the media for so many years, and I wanted to do it respectfully, but also, you know, we have to tell a story at the same time, so I think it does all of those things, and I'm, I'm hope, hopefully will open people's eyes to the reality of these events.